Okay, right, today's speaker is another animation speaker, and it's David Bunty, who is another brilliant animator. He's worked at places like Disney, at Ardman, and he's currently um, working on uh, Chuddington, and he's also in the process of creating his own series as well, which I don't think you've got that one. Golden Dinosaur. So he is, we're very lucky to have him, and you'll see, he's brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. It's really nice to be here. Um, was anyone here the last time that I was here about a year ago? A few. Okay, so um, I'm going to be covering some of the same stuff, but some entirely new things. I've never given this exact talk. I'm going to give you an app. So, I mean, I've done many various things in animation. I've worked through a, a lot of the different departments, depending on what jobs are available and who's paying bills. So, um, but a lot of my work is in storyboarding now, so I'm going to be um, talking about that specifically towards the end. Uh, last year I was lucky to go back to Ardman and work in-house on Series 4 of Short the Sheep in storyboarding, which is just the storyboard artist's dream job. Uh, because, you know, there's no dialogue, it's pure visual communication. Um, pure slapstick. It's a you know it's a real joy to, to get into. And then as Sarah said, I'm currently storyboarding on Juggington, which is a, a totally different style of show and uh, a totally different storyboarding challenge, which is why I love it and great to be able to jump from those different genres, silent comedy to action adventure in preschool. Uh, where they swing the camera all around and the cinematography is really what you're thinking about. So we'll be talking more about that later. And Sarah said I'm also currently <coughs> co-creating a new preschool TV series, which I'm just going to tease you into your glimpse um, a little bit later, um, called Boy and Dinosaur. It's a bad boy and a dinosaur. And if you would be precise, and uh, oh, there he is, that's a little still, which uh, development still, when he's going around broadcasters, and you know, boy oh boy, development takes a long time. There's no guarantees that maybe if it's on the TV in a few years, you saw it here first. Uh, but he won't look like that because a few broadcasters that I can't mention don't like the dungarees, for starters, or the hair, and that's development. <coughs> uh, but I'm going to talk about development. I'm going to show you some other uh, type of things. I'm going to show you a short film that I produced this time called The Astronomer's Son, which I showed here last, uh, last time, which is a wonderful short film I produced for, uh, for Channel 4 in the formation of the digital <coughs> short scheme um, from two, uh, directed by two young graduates straight out of, straight out of university from the Edinburgh College of Arts who went on the... And this was first thing they did, a chance to make their own film, what an amazing scheme, and, uh, and a couple of them jumped straight on to, um, to, into amazing careers. Two worked on Frank and Weenie, pursuing careers in, uh, in stop motion animation, so it's a talent development <coughs> scheme, it's amazing. Uh, it's sad that Formation Studio Shorts isn't running, but maybe it will soon, I hope so. But I started as a, um, animating when I was a kid, I just, you know, I don't know, how many animators do we have in the room? Yeah, a few of you. So, I, mean, I don't know about you, and, and all the rest of you in your respective sort of careers you're pursuing. But for me, I just, it was really early on that I knew what I wanted to do. I, you know, I never agonized about, what, am I, what do I want to do when I, you know, I, I, I saw amazing films. I, said, I went to the cinema, I saw a team. I was like, wow. And just life changed in terms of that impact of what you can do in, in storytelling on the screen, and then I saw the Jungle Book, and I was like, well, that's amazing, that's what I want to do, and it was just a question of how do they do that? How do they make these drawings move? You know they're drawings, and yet you, and yet you believe in them, and you emote for them, and you cry for them, and I was just completely hooked. And I knew it was an illusion, and that was the greatest thing, and there weren't many books on the subject. It was kind of like this big, mysterious thing, animation. Um, and the magic trick was really it. So um, I, I found the only book I could. You know, you ask your parents, you think they know everything in the world. How do you make cartoons? And, uh, and eventually, <coughs> Dad got 
got me a Super 8 Cine camera. It's about nine years old. Uh, I had a single frame reflex, and uh, I went away and you had little cartridges, and I made films out of everything, including Lego drawings, cutouts. You see Lego stuff all the time on YouTube, right? It's a huge movement, like, you know, Lego animation. Why? Because it's just out there, it's so easy, right, to play with and to manipulate. It just begs to be played to anything I can grab. That's what I, that's what I did. And, uh, and then I really want to emulate the cartoons I loved, which was Looney Tunes and all of that sort of stuff, you know? And so I wanted to discover cell animation. So, you know, I was 14 years old doing cell painting. I was a complete idiot, you know, ages on, you know, big rostrum cameras that, that my uncle made for me. And it was like, you know, how do you pan North, East, South, West, and all of that? They could just do it on a computer. Uh, um, and, uh, and, and because of that, I think, love of starting as a child animating, I uh, think that's why I really like working with young people of all ages to, uh, to animate in museums, in schools, I re I, I, um, for four years I ran an outreach program through the National Media Museum um, where we zoned in to look at what animation, how animation can be an enabler in primary and secondary education as a creative tool for learning in the same way that theatre and education, dance and any other creative subject can enhance learning experiences and uh, you know I love that stuff and I try to, to push it and um, it's just an amazing thing to be able to get that medium in your hands and to be able to say, there it is, this is how easy it is to do and let's push your storytelling, your creativity, what you want to say to the world through this. They wouldn't want to make films. So, I want a few of them, I want awards too. You can see them on YouTube, just have a look. I've uh, got loads of them. So, um, where do I want to start? Um, I just started right as a drawn animator mainly, and it, in fact it doesn't matter if you the drawn animator, CG animation, stop motion animator, you know, um, drawing is the most important. If you can draw, um, then uh, then you have such an advantage. And I, you know, I've always struggled with my drawing. You know, I mean, I, I, and, and, and I'm someone that's gone. You know, I don't like computers. I'm going to stick stick drawing. But I, you know, never happy with my drawing. It's always been a thing, but it's, it's just something that quick sketches, whenever I sketchbook drawings, and just soaking up the world, because that's what you put back out. So be it life drawing or quick sketches of the world around you, um, this is where it comes from. You know, where do you get ideas from for animation in anything? It's from the real world. It's from what you, it's from what you know. So going out into the real world, you know, it's so important. And that's, that's how fun drawing is, right? It's a little lot of fun. So, um, and, uh, and also, um, I, visual effects animation is where I started. I'm going to show you a little bit of that quickly. Um, and so, fire, smoke, all of that. So, taking photographs, of course, too. Just soaking up that, that real world, that medium. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, my, my, my first big gig in animation, the first thing I really trained at, I, I, I trained as a drawn animator um, in Dublin at um, uh, a place called Valley of Thermot, um, which is on the west side of Dublin, the roughest, toughest area of Dublin, right? And, uh, and yet it had, at the time, one of the best uh, animation courses in Europe for classical drawn animation. Uh, and we had Disney feature animation in Paris, and uh, they had a mentoring program, and I did an internship at Disney Paris in visual effects, which was, I discovered that actually, much as I like storytelling and acting, that I could act, I could put more emotion into fire and water and all those other things that I could do into characters. It should consider my drawing style more, more graphic. But, um, um, and, and, but, you know, I always loved special effects. Illusion, right? And uh, this is me, um, uh, spot the health and safety here in this scene when I, which I shot when I was about I don't know, 12. And there's one of my mates, which I stuffed to the back of the carriage with some fire in front on a, on a metal pole with probably flammable paint on it. 
electric wires, fantastic stuff, things to do to make films. So, uh, but here's a lesson in life. Um, yeah, you, you know, you want, if you want long life, draw special effects. You know, it's like the health and safety risks are much less just a paper cut, right? So, uh, and that's stuff that I just went on to do. So, be it water, the elements, shadows, which is often about the drama and the lighting. Um, you know, fire, playing with shapes. It's all about sitting it into. And when people now, often for budgetary reasons a lot, just using plugins and After Effects or whatever, use stuff and effect in. The effects, so often they, they look out of place because they're not part of the, the overall art direction, the environment of the thing. I think that as such a lot of my job in visual effects was to bring in the art direction of that, to support the storytelling. If it's, if it's abstract, if it's flat, if it's stop motion like this, these, these swirls, all this smoke, drew with charcoal over the top. And you know, the compositing tools that you have now make this type of effect. You know, there's just so, it's just so much, you've got so much more choice to be able to do things, but it's always about the art direction and the Tigger movie was my first big break. Um, you know, I'd done a little bit, I worked at King Rollo's as a trainee, but my first big job was um, the Tigger movie and I jumped straight out of college for Bally Fermat after doing an internship at Disney. I, I'd applied, I'd heard that the Tigger movie was starting up in London, uh, they were doing a sequence, and, um, and I, I applied when I was there, came back from Valley firm, which I think it was about a, home for about a week, and then the telephone rang from Tandem Films, saying, do you want to come down and work on the Tigger movie? And I, you know, I was so lucky, it was, the timing was just so right, and, uh, you know, I didn't realise how lucky I was at the time for that to happen, you know? And it was a great film to work on, though. <laughs> the Sherman Brothers, the legendary Sherman Brothers, are such a part of Disney, actually came out of retirement to write songs. Um, it was a <coughs> director DVD release where we worked on it um, and they changed it halfway through into a theatrical release and the budgets went up and my contract went from about two months to six months. Um, and we worked on this sequence called Tigger's Family Tree Sequence which was a fantasy sequence in the film uh, which was just you know that great tradition of Disney fantasy song sequences where which was wonderful for me. I mean, I actually, I'll tell you that, I, I didn't go in as a visual effect animator. That's what I wanted to do. They gave me a, I, I was offered a job as a layout artist. And, and my, and my, my horrid secret was that although I could really compose in storyboards and short sketches, I could, I'd never found a way to be able to really break that out into the big detailed Disney layouts. I just couldn't do it. Um, but of course I said, yes, I'll take the job. And then, and then when I went down to, to the job and, and the production manager said, uh, you know, what are you here for? They didn't, you know, uh, and, and I think I said something stupid like, um, well, uh, I think I'm, I'm, I'm here to be a layout artist, but what I'd really like to be is a, um, an effect art animator. <laughs> and, and would you believe they had, they didn't have a dedicated effects animator, but they had a huge amount of special effects without anyone really knowing how to do it, and they just had a scene come back from LA that had been rejected on the special effects. So they said they'd give it to me to see how I got on. And, um, and then about three months later, one of the directors turn, was turning around and he was saying, whatever happened to that layout artist? <laughs> and I, you know, well, I thought that was supposed to be me. Um, so let me show you some, some of um, this is all animated on, on paper, um, and um, this is all animated on paper, uh, and uh, I, 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 I'll shout out in my bits of these, okay? <coughs> oh, he's got the sound on here. Yeah, he goes from... It's on the DVD. Right, okay, not in the computer. No, no it, didn't, it didn't play out of the computer. Right, okay, you can turn into it. Oh, no, no. <coughs> oh, no, no. Okay. Go 
got to hear the song. Ah, and Now it's two main animators they work together. Roger Rabbit, Billy Meyer, and they work just to We want uh, some some reference on hands because hands are really tricky to draw. And Chris was like, "Why do you need reference pictures of hands? You've got two of them right here." So, you know, he was 
this is pre-internet, really. There's no Google image search. So, so, and he thought, well, you know, sod that, I'm just going to draw my own hands. So he drew a sheet of his own hands, gave it to the art director, and this is amazing! Where did you find this? And uh, so he promptly went up the ladder, right, and, uh, and designed all these amazing characters of Disney. Uh, went, any, anyway, um, and then probably never got a director credit on the Tigger movie, even though he directed the sequence. So he was going, I'm off to America. The rest is history. So, uh, so you can start recording again. Um, so uh, I want to show you one more bit for uh, visual effects, which is Thunderbirds, uh, which was a real joy. I mean, basically, after the Tigger movie, right, I was like, that's my career, that's what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. I'm going to dedicate my life to drawn visual effects. And uh, even though the film, and there were films coming around the corner in London, there was stuff from Fox, when it, there was Titan AE and uh, Space Jam from Warner Brothers, not Space Jam, um, the Iron Giant had just been released, and then coming out with Osmosis Jones, and then there was DreamWorks, Stallion, and the Cimarron. And I, and I was off, and I, and I looked at, we looked at some of them, I saw what they were doing down the road, these amazing people animated the Disney's, and, and they were just going mad doing all these turns and shadows. Normally, effect movies meant, the story's normally pretty rubbish, but it's an effect movie. I was like, do I really want to do effects on bad stories? I knew I liked storytelling, right? But anyway, um, I got offered about, put on to three feature films. My, my list of the films that I was offered to do jobs on, you know, is way more impressive than the ones that I've done because uh, LA just started reeling in the effects. And within sort of six months of me thinking, well, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life, it was like, no more drawn effects, and I was going, what do we do? It's like, this, you know, it, it, it's like suddenly the world's changed, and it's all gone CG, and, you know, I, I, I started working in a bar. I just didn't know where, where my head <coughs> was going, and I, and I desperately tried to train in computers, because I thought, well, that's all I have to do, because I need to learn computers, because I'm an animator, and even though my brain was telling me, that just isn't right for you, that just isn't right for you. At one time, I, I didn't listen to my gut, and I went out and I did this MA in, in animation at, at Bournemouth. It's a really amazing place, working with a couple of fantastic guys who were, one's a producer at um, a frame store, the other was a lead shader artist for the world on Gravity. I mean, but these guys were just like computer geeks, and since they were like, you know, toddlers in the same way that I was drawing in cartoons, right? Um, and and I, anyway, yeah, it just didn't work out. But what I learned was story to make films. So it powered me back in, which was good. And then randomly got a chance to do Thunderbirds. And I'll show you a clip from this, because I, I looked at this. Um, this was anyone see, this was a title sequence of Thunderbirds movie. Do you know anyone seen it? 2004. And the director of Thunderbirds was... Guy from Star Trek: The Next Generation, which I watched when I was at university, which was a uh, Will Riker, Mr. Number One, make it so. He was very, very tall, and uh, and um, and I did all these drawn effects like uh, explosions. It was boys. It was like Saturday kids cartoons, which the producers in like the director really mind me saying because they're going, "This is so hell. We do RT, but it, yeah, it's it's fun. Explosions and it's tsunamis." And uh, so again, research, right? First thing I did, again, really pre-internet, was just go out to the shop, buy surfing mags, put them around, well, it probably wasn't pre-internet, it just knew that I would use the thing, put them around the desk, you know, and uh, got reference, and, and then designed these shots, and, uh, oh, this was a cool shot. The art, uh, Bruce Mellich, from our director, drew this, and he was like going, all right, this is a comet, and I want this comet to be like, you know, w to feel like it's stylistically on the side of a sports car, you know, those things that are drawn down. And, um, but I, I tried to adapt the physics into this so we could animate whether it was spiky, but, you know, there's a lot of science you needed think about it. Like, really, will this play? Yeah. 
this uh, medium of town. Uh, uh, this was, and it worked out after map to CG. Basically, it was all CG apart from drawn effects. There were a couple of us doing drawn animation on light boxes. Everything else was flash and after effects, and uh, we felt like museum exhibits. And they brought, in my first week, um, um, the director over to have a look at what we were doing, Jonathan Frakes. And everyone was like, and, and you know, and, and they were going, here we've got computers, and, and then each other, and here we've got people are animating on paper. And it was like, you know, talking about as if we're dinosaurs or something. And then they had to justify the goat, and they quickly, quickly say, but then we vectorize it. As if, like, you know, that makes it all better then, that's okay. Uh, so, uh, but it was, so it was a weird thing, but it was great, because, I mean, um, I had to work out how to map all this stuff to CG things, so. You know, divide a system where we had to print it all out. Now it's so easy, you can just work on a Cintiq, but then we had to copy all of the frames by hand, work out a, um, a system for registering the drawing. Let's see. There you go. Um, and, yeah. Here's Thunderbirds. From a secret island in the South Pacific, the courageous Tracy family run an organization called International Rescue. When disaster strikes anywhere in the world, they are always first on the scene. They go by the name they gave their incredible machines, the Thunderbirds. Five, four, three, two, one. Thunderbirds are go. Experiences working with characters, 
across publishing bit and sort of stepping into supervising and, and really loved that. And um, I got an opportunity to retrain as a professional animator in feature film storyboarding at Ardman Animations um, with one of the leading uh, tutors in the world, Frank Gladstone, who is here and uh, was a head of training at Disney Feature Animation through the Renaissance there, and then through DreamWorks Feature Animation through their Renaissance, and um, as being a director and producer and tutor pretty much everywhere. Uh, and it was amazing. Three, three months paid training um, at Ardman Features in 2008. And, uh, yeah, but what can I say? I mean, it's, uh, and then, well, then, and then after that, straight after that, got an opportunity to jump onto Shaun the Sheep Series 2 um, to try and put into practice some of what we learned. Because actually, Shaun the Sheep TV series is storyboarding a lot more like feature film storyboarding is. Um, you know, it changes all the time. I mean, a lot of so, uh, some TV, there's a sort of the, the sort of the standard churn out TV storyboarding is you get a script, everything's written out, including sometimes master shots, which is close up of this, long shot of this, and it's kind of like, okay, I would take my brain out now and put it on the desk, and I'm just going to illustrate, right? I hate that. You know, it, it's like stop. I always get really rebellious when I pick up a script in master shot. Whenever a writer says, it's going to be an angle on this, almost certainly isn't. Well, when I bought it anyway. Uh, but anyway, that's an aside. But so, so in this, there's none of that. I'm going to show you a little script sample from Shoulder Sheep a little bit later. But uh, generally, it's a beat. How do you script something that doesn't have dialogue? It's really hard. So uh, you work a lot of it out in the story room with the director, board artist, the editor. And it's a really messy phase. And it's, it's, I, I think of it like workshopping, like theatre. It's going into a, into a rehearsal room in a theatre. You've got a script. That's, you know, you try to respect that script. But then it's about how do you stage that? What's the best way to, what's the opportunities for character, for humour? for everything within the confines of that story and the genre of what you're telling. Um, so it's a, it's a wonderful thing. Um, I'll come back to that, but first... Oh yeah, because that's right, because after that, and I, you know I only got an, an episode on Sean, because after training is all, they then farmed out half of the, uh, half the storyboards in the series to Israel, which made a lot of sense. Not uh, so the but anyway, I, I, I quickly got an opportunity to come back to the uh, to produce. Um, I got a phone call from an amazing woman, Camilla Deacon, who um, who was a producer for Formation Scheme and really responsible for a lot of the amazing stuff that happened on Channel Four. Which during the nineties and Sarah, you were part of really the yeah, but I was more Claire Pixar. Uh, really yeah, right the end. yeah. So, in, in terms of the Channel 4 and the work that yeah, Channel 4 yeah. did really in building. Right the end, really. Yeah, <coughs> absolutely. The roof is still there. And Claire, and Claire Kitson and all, all that she did at Channel 4 to really support emerging artists. So many amazing artists came out of the funding of Channel 4 and exposure that Channel 4 gave. Really, on kind of, on prime, yeah, prime time slot, it was evening. You had like Friday evenings, Channel 4, you'd have like a half hour dedicated magazine program showing off new animation. How about that? And, uh, and, and it's a reason, really, that the UK developed some of the most, you know, most amazing, pioneering, um, independent filmmakers like Sarah that came through that, you know, that, that the opportunity that, that Channel 4 provided. And, um, and there was a break in funding because, you know, we got Big Brother and all the rest of it. And, uh, 
and budgets went down, and uh, so formations, basically they, got, they gave me the opportunity to run it on about the 10th of the budget. Would you like to produce something on the 10th of the budget, uh, where you've got to guarantee to bring it in on budget, on schedule, and uh, to broadcast artistic standards in the name of Channel 4 Shorts? Sure, I'll do that. And uh, boy, that was, you know, but yeah, it, it, and it, was, it was amazing, and it was hard, but it was such a fun thing to do. Took about, it was supposed to be about four months. It ended up taking a little over a year, and um, but it was worth all of the effort, and it's, it, uh, it it became actually one of the most one of the most successful films in that run on Formation's Digital Shorts. We won 16 awards around the world, um, and uh, Screen Yorkshire's most successful animated short ever, and. Um, and I just tell you about that really, but there, there's and um, the graduates. So I, you know, two graduates, and basically they had, they had to choose us. They had to sort of, you know, they wanted filmmakers to really, to really have a lot of say and be really comfortable with the whole process. So basically, there were two people they pitched into Channel Four, okay, and then there were three executives. It was Channel Four, it was a regional screen agency, so Screen Yorkshire in my case, and then it was the UK Film Council. All of which were represented, so it's three commissioning ed editors, okay, which all which means three different opinions all the time, and uh, or at least three different things that you need to take on the box, and the script editor, um, and 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 they came out with that this idea which they pitched. Channel Four and the other organisations really loved the potential of it, which is what normally happens in development, and they really were impressed with what they'd done in the past, so they knew what they could do. They didn't care for the story in its original form, they didn't want to make that film. So, um, but unlike Formations, Formations Old, where you went through a development scheme and they took it or didn't, this we knew we had to get through, and they, they, they went through this huge script development thing. Script Factory in London, their amazing script editor Alan Gildy came on, and they went to screenwriting workshops, and what I enjoyed most was really shepherding this through story, and what I found, what I always find, is that a lot of animators, myself included, think visually. Don't think in words. It only makes sense when it's off the page. Something like, something like Shaun like the Sheep, you only know what you've got, when you get it off the page and onto the pictures and onto the reels, and it doesn't matter how many times you've done that. Um, so I was really keen to stop batting this back and forth on the script and start to work through our story issues in storyboard and on reels. Um, oh yes, that's my co-producer Peter Kershaw, who's now in Santa Fe, lucky devil, with his, uh, his wife, who's the head of museums out there. And some of the awards. Um, so, so I produced it. Oh, I did a few other things, yeah. I, uh, I also played the voice, which involved a lot of screaming. Um, they, they were going, what did I say? They, they said, they said, they said it. We, want, we want to have the sound of, um, is it, is it similar? The ultimate sound of suffering. But I, uh, we recorded this in a residential house, a director's house, and uh, without telling the, the next door neighbours what we were doing. Well, the police might have turned up after, after the recording session was out, uh, and I could hear my voice for the rest of the week. That aside, it was all good fun. And uh, so, yes, yeah, so the concept art, exploring, it's observatory, always think. Don't have a lot of time to really talk into short films now, but here's the thing. I swear by this, right? If you're making a short film, it's like uh, you look at all the great. It's like you have so little time. It's such an art to make a, a narrative short film that's. Uh, but it's a three minutes, but this was three act story structure. We were really focused into three acts, and uh, you know, the less you've got to set up, the less you've got to do, the better. So, one set, two characters, um, so many films share, short films share that. This. Uh, this is how much stories change. I'm actually going to show you this film in a bit. The ten did not exist in the film. Um, you know, it just wasn't there, it, and, uh, and, it, and it came out through a workshop session in the script workshop in London. Fact became 
the character that you saw the film for. It was this, really the central character. Um, and, uh, you know, how can you not love a mechanical teddy bear, right? It kind of gave a heart to the film. Um, with some designs for it. Um, that's really cheap to make, too. The main character was a lot more expensive. Um, this is a way that we looked at story. I got them to do a beat boards where they just got, we did a whole script pass. We just got a couple of sentences for each scene, each main section of a plot point of a story. We just do a drawing for that to illustrate. And on to the next. And this is a way that we got this through. We got to grips with story problems and we and we got it into development. And then from then in, we've got to talk about this more. It's a great way to work, you know. Make sure you understand the story before you storyboard. Make sure it's all there. And then, and then we broke into it. Once we got that right, then we could go from the speed boards and start storyboarding. And it was done. I, I, I love working on post-it notes and little cards. You know, these were independent sheets that you can pin up, you can tear down, you can change around. You know, I hate those printed out little um, templates because they, they say to you, don't change it, because if you change it, you have to cut it out and you have to cross it out and you have to, you know, it, 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 it's like when this is what you should be doing, you should be changing it all the time. Is this shot better over here? Is it better without it? Is it, what about if I do this? So, um, so we did it loose. We uh, recorded it under a rostrum, and uh, we made the film that way. Um, meanwhile, Jess um, is a, just an amazing sculptor, and she's going to buy him puppets because they say there's so much to do. There's so there's so much to do when you make a short film, right? So many pressures, and like, let's just get a rig in. But I, I knew that Jess was just great at model making, and I also knew that was quite a hefty bottom budget if you did that. And I was like, so I said, well, what about if we, you know, got you into McKinnon and Saunders, perhaps, and, uh, and and got you to learn from some of, from a, a mentor? Wouldn't that be a, a, an amazing thing to come out of this? And so I clicked on the phone, and they said yes, and she went in, and they gave her a little a mentor. She sat in the room for a, a couple of weeks. Made this amazing thing. Uh, a year later, they brought her back to work on Frankel with me in the props department. Um, so, just exposing yourself to opportunities, I think, is something I've really learned. Right? Uh, you know, the industry changes all the time. Being multi-skilled, just just jumping at anything. Um, so, and this was some of the process in making these models. Just the attention to detail. Look at those. They're amazing. The heads, the um, the facial expressions were just for replacement heads. That's it. And I'm always amazed at this film how much emotion the animators got out of four heads. Um, the hair was actual human hair. This is a sort of the level of detail that you know that went into this. It was she went from a hairdresser. Um, and uh, you know, and, and, and individual human hairs plucked onto one head times that by four gives you a sense of the workload in a film like this, and that's a full puppet with his head. Uh, we didn't have a studio, so um, we used one of the directors. Um, um, uh, what was it? Concert. They called it a shed, darn big shed, uh, and uh, which his brother was using as a gym. So his brother very kindly agreed to dispose of his gym for a year and took everything out. He painted it black. There's Simon there, the observatory. Simon always said the film was put together with duck and sticky tape. You know, love that. It was just resourcing from what you had. It was a peanuts budget, really. The budget really just allowed us to do the delivery requirements and everything to make it a professional film, and and you know gave them the tools to do the job. And they didn't earn much. Some of the 
painting. This was the most expensive thing in the film. They, 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 they commissioned this to be made, this observatory roof. That was too complicated for them to do themselves. And, uh, yeah, which did that cost? I think it was about 800 pounds, something like that. It, it, it was, I don't know, the public was that, but it was, it was more expensive. It was the most expensive thing I've done, which I'm always amazed at. You only have it, like, you only glimpse it in a couple of shots. Man, I'd have been like, getting that, getting that observatory in every shot. Look at this! But, uh, but everything was made, apart from that observatory roof, right, out of a, uh, just things around, just, just odds and ends. And that was kind of like the spirit, it's not, the original idea just came from making this stuff out of anything they could find. And this is a detail. All of these individual letters, individually written, these are written. I don't know how Simon did I mean, they're absolutely tight. How those big, that big. And they, you know, I think he took out a lot of frustrations on those. I just picked up what this, I picked up one randomly, and it was like a letter um, to one of the executive producers. <laughs> can't, can't put that in the film. There's probably one written to me somewhere. And if you go to the National Media Museum, it's in the animation gallery. It's up there. So if you get a magnifying glass, let me know what the letter to me says. I'd love to read that. Uh, so, and then, and then it was, I mean, this was a lighting, you know, we did all this detail, we really wanted to just, one of them was uh, done with this, it was very simple points of focus. Uh, three guys who stuffed in that shed for near on a year, Simon, Jess, and the guy at the back, Steve Warren, who was in his second year, he spent his summer holidays, oh, that's a schedule that I set up for them. Um, there he is, spent his summer holidays animating this, Kind of like me, he was animating since he was about 11 or 12, stop motion, he knew what he wanted to do. And uh, he'd already been down to Ardwood to do a bit of work experience. And um, he got this on his reel. He did the best, the best character animation in this film. Just sad, amazing stuff. And he's now a feature film animator. Um, he's got about three feature film credits to his name, including Frankenwing. Um, and that's dedication to the cause, right? This is how hard. I, I, I promise this was not me. I did not tell Jess to work on her birthday. But, uh, you know, she wanted to do the shot again. It was done. She wasn't happy with it. So, uh, you yeah. know, just a dedication to love. But I, what I tried to do was to, was, was to bring in people, bring in this team. It's a real firm believer that if you partner young talent with, with, industry, with, with seasoned talent, then amazing things can happen. Uh, and Adam was kind of like um, looking for an option. He was our assistant editor, who quickly became our editor. Probably shouldn't say this because the original editor walked off because because he couldn't work with the, with these young directors that never worked with editors before. But there you go. So uh, it probably teaches you how to work with editors. And they were doing. Can we take frame off here and the frame off there? And, uh, and uh, you know, on an animatic. It's not the way you work with editors. But you talk about story with editors, so you're like, I'm not going to work with them. And, and Adam became our editor and did an amazing job, and he's now an editor in London. Um, and I did draw and vision effects as well, because, you know, hey, it's like, you know, it's an effect shot, I have to do some of that. So, uh, and we did an amazing things. with God, this amazing composite that come in and do stuff I couldn't dream of. Um, um, yeah, it did pretty well at festivals, in fact. I thought I should show you this, because we always talk about sending your films off to festivals, and this was my festival tracker, a little bit of it. And, um, what's a yes at the top? That, I think, was a, uh, a, for the British Animation Awards. Oh yeah, we got that in. But then it was like, all of these, no, 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 no. It was, you know, it was about six no's till we got a yes. And often you give up if you've got it back a couple of times, right? So that was just persistence. I always knew it had an audience. So much about film festival success, I think, is no, or any for getting it out there is knowing who your audience is, right? Always knew this had a big sci fi audience. Um, and so I, I zeroed in on science fiction festivals. If you, if you just zero it, you know, you got the wish list of 
you know, you want to get to the BAFTAs, you want to get to the Oscars, you've got festivals you need to hit, you've got the big animation awards, but then it's about finding your audience, and, and we got, and then a bandwagon starts. You have one festival that really likes it, and all you really response to it, you win an award, and then, and then after you've won a few awards, the festivals just start coming to you, and just an amazing thing happens, so, um, So that's my tip, find an audience. Uh, let's have a look at it. Oh. Uh, oh, I did Well, I did. show, yes. This is, this is when I was 16 or so, or maybe younger. Flipping drawings and shooting blind tests on Super 8. And that's me painting on this house. Dedication to the cause.
But as you say, all those reds were like, no. You know, I, was, I knew we had a film the audiences, the right audience would love. Um, and, uh, but you know, it took time. And it, went, it, 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 it was about one and a half years on the festival circuit. You can have up to two years, really, that's it. That's your festival life. And uh, it, 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 it's such a great thing. For about one and a half years, it just went around. It just travelled. The tapes just went around the world from one place to another. The couriers just took them around. Uh, and, uh, yeah. fantastic thing. Um, oh. Here's a boy and a dinosaur. Uh, and uh, because I'm talking of, this is the first time I've shown them these sketches. And this is confidential stuff. All right, the phone's away. Uh, but I wanted to show you this because, yeah, we'll put that, uh, because this is the first development sketches. Um, I went to all about ideas and how you, how you get them in development. You know, it, it, finding our characters, I really wanted to have our character designer be part of the writing team in a way, defining who these characters were. Um, and so, you know, we knew we had solid synopsis for our characters. And the brief of the dinosaur was this was a dinosaur that um, a four-year-old boy imagined a dinosaur to be. You know, not how a dinosaur really, literally would be. That was a thing. So and I thought that's a really interesting brief to give to a designer. And this was a young designer, Gillian Reed, who um, was only about four years, no, two years, two years, I think, hit that out of, uh, out of all the Art Institute. And she was, but she'd done quite a bit already, just around, and, um, and we had, we had, you know, we sent out, we got applications in far and wide, right? Far, all around the world, including Emmy, we had an Emmy nominate, we had an Emmy winning character design. And we, well, we chose Gillian just because she felt right for it. So, you know, work speaks for itself. And uh, these were sketches that she did on the plane in her sketchbook. Just exploring dinosaur. What type of, nor more than many varied possibilities. Which have ears like a dog. Uh, you know, uh, can it contort? Can it walk a bit like stairs? Um, uh, you know, can it, what are the playful, you know, can it stand on its head? Can, uh, you know, can it dangle? Well, how small or big is boy compared to it? Um, you know, how can and a lot of it, you know. So all of these things, all these ideas, and it's small, small, small. What other ideas do we get? It's just like a roll, it's a riff. And this was her first pass to us. That's the first pass, you know. And then we started working. And then we started zeroing in on things like head shapes. What does a head look like? All right, what different sort of sizes of muzzle? Quite a challenge to have a great big muzzle on a character when, especially in CG, when you can't cheat it in a drawing. It's fine in a drawing, but if you have it on a model and you've got a, a camera lens here, suddenly you can't see the expression and all of that stuff. So we really paid a lot of attention to because we knew that our dinosaur wasn't going to <laughs> talk. But maybe it will. Um, but uh, um, but we knew that expression was going to be really important, facial expression. So the eyes, well, we knew they had to read, so we looked at that a lot. Um, and uh, I'm not going, actually, let me just show you this now. Let me show you this now. Um, so, and this is fine, because this is all out there. Uh, and uh, all I can say is, so this is like the first pass in a way, to develop you spent, this is a product of about a year. No, it's not. They say it's a year, it's not. Six months of development. Um, on and off, six months of development. Um, and, uh, you know, and a lot of work. And there's great people worked on this. My co-director is Paul Cavella, who was animation supervisor for Bob the Builder, Pingu, Chuggington, um, you know, a, 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 a legend in, in Manchester, stop frame animation, an amazing guy, and, uh, and Davy Moore, 
is our lead writer, Davy Moore, who is uh, one of the one of the most exciting writers around. Um, who is well, started work start, started working on in the development team for Balamori. Worked on Teletubbies, I think was his first job. Then was developing team on Balamori. Worked in Happy House for the BBC, for both Ragdoll and BBC. Um, uh, Rasta Mouse. He went to preschool. He probably didn't watch that. Um, you know, load, loads of load. He's written on everything. Um, and it was just a great. Ex and then and then Jane Hicks, for an editor, ended up being so important. Who is the supervising editor on Chuggington right now? And I'm working with Jane right now on Chuggington actually. So you know, it's just sharing the love. And uh, but it was just a lot of people coming together. Um, and me actually, you know, having the balls to pick up the phone and going to, hey, you don't know me, Paul, but would you like to work with me on the, and, you know, it's just a great thing to get an amazing team together and talk about, we literally had a high concept right, which was, which was taken from a student film, a student short film called Boy and the, the Dinosaur, I think. And it, it, we took it down offline, I'm sorry, because it was just confusing broadcasters, because i tell you what happened, it was a, uh, it was a spoof children's animation, right? Which had a, a boy dreaming for a dinosaur. Um, dreams on a shooting star for a dinosaur. And uh, goes to sleep, dreams of dinosaurs. And then uh, he's playing with dinosaur in his sleep. It's there, it's throwing him in the air. It's like acrobatics, it's wonderful. And then he wakes up. And then, oh, he's woken up. And then it's there, in the room. And, um, and he runs to the dinosaur. Dinosaur, love me, love me. And the dinosaur eats a boy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, apparently, this is so embarrassing, for some unbidden reason, that tape actually went in and got mixed up with one of the tapes, famously, admit, with one of the big conferences, right? And it became the buzz thing, because all these broadcasters went in going, have you seen this show? Have you seen this? You wouldn't believe this. It's like it would be the funniest thing ever. You're all having a hoot and like, yeah, look at these guys. They're going to make a show out of you know this dinosaur eating a boy. But we had a, some entrepreneurial producer by the name of Russell Diva, um, who's really, you know spent his life working in publishing, saw that and thought, you know what? If you delete the ending, there's something there. There could be a series there. And um, after about a you know, a couple of years or more of exploring it. Asked if I'd like to try my hand at exploring it. And I pulled the development team together and uh, we had that high concept, that was it. It's a boy and dinosaur, and they like better pals. And that was it, really, apart, and, and apart from its preschool. And we, and, and it was, we sat in a coffee shop, many long days, tea shops, eating cakes, having tea, talking about what type of show would we like to make that we never get the chance to make? What type of preschool show we could, could we make? What are the many varied things that this can be? And, uh, you know, that doesn't happen often. A lot, often in series development, it's the stuff that doesn't work is the stuff where it's packaged and it's just like, you know, and it's driven by marketing. You know, oh, we've got to have lots of characters because we need to sell them all the shops. And if you want to sell lots of toys, more toys equals more sales, right? And that's how a lot of the logic goes. And we fought that and said, no, do you know what the most successful children's property ever is Winnie the Pooh? It's a very small cast. Uh, and, um, you know, it's about falling in love with something. So, uh, so we won the battle, and uh, this is... This was our first passive, what we thought it would be cool to do.
every, you know, my first year students make, which is, you know, looking at their story and they're starting to storyboard it before they know what the end of their story is, for example. And it's like, you can't, you can't do that. It's like everything you build has to pay off down the line. Every shot is there for a point, and every shot supports the story, which is normally, and the ending is the message of your film. That's so important. So, know the char know the characters, know the story. In the case of Shaun the Sheep, that meant having a really established character. And the first thing I did for the first day was just to get a bulk of the Shaun the Sheep DVDs and watch Shaun the Sheep, and draw up and have a sketchbook beside me, and I paused and I just watched, and I just drew very quickly poses, and I got to no, know Sean, and I got no bits, uh, I mean we had a huge storyboard pack, but there were no real model sheets, so I just pinned the stuff around my desk, and that was so important, I think some of the people were going, what are you doing, what are you doing, I think we're just drawing characters, but you know, if, if, I, if I get Sean wrong, then it's like, it's not going to be the right Sean. I mean, the animators put it on Sean, but it's a lot better if it starts with me. I, you know, if, if I don't know the character, it's not going to work. Um, there's research. Especially on Sean the Sheep. I know what it is. They seem to give me stories which are all about sport. And I am not the person to give sports scripts to. I was like, table tennis? How do you play table tennis? So... And it doesn't really matter to some sense because it's, you know, it's a farce, they break the rules. But I like to have some indication of it. So, you know, I absorbed myself in table tennis for a day or whatever it was. And, and we found these, you know, doesn't that look like Vitzer? Doesn't that look like a dog right there? Just this great stuff and just ideas just started to come to you that you just wouldn't have found. All the stuff is out there in real life. So again, and we had, I used Google this time, and YouTube, you know, on a, um, uh, and, oh, you are going to play, yeah, oh, so this, and research comes from everywhere, so from, from stills, from sourcing out, YouTube clip, there was so much funny stuff on table tennis, you know, silly table tennis games, prat shots, you put loads of those into it, loads of it. Um, and then it comes from real life. I just showed you a clip from Boy and the Dinosaur. And um, this, I recorded the other day. It just randomly happened. And I was like, where's, I don't have a camera with me. Oh, I've got my iPhone, I'll use this. Um, and this is some um, video reference of, play. Oh, there's no video, wait a minute. Let me just find, search for it. Oh, I hope the codec works. It's in Little Lottie, it is, uh, uh, and um, we're doing this thing about sliding, which you might have, and so I, she was on the slide, so I seized the moment and cannily just pushed her into, how about sliding some of the things that maybe you're in the script, and see what happens.
And so it goes on. So, um, <laughs> for about 10 minutes. <laughs> but, uh, you know, wonderful. So it comes from real life. And I want to I want to stress this. All right, this I think is one of the most important things. It's like to be an animator, to be a filmmaker, to do anything in storytelling. You need to have a life. You know, it it kind of makes sense. It? It's like, and and I remember Glenn, and I was lucky enough to have Glenn Keane from Disney. He, he came and he mentored us for like a day, and. Um, and he said to us, he said the first time that he got his, you know, he went to Disney, he said he had a choice to make. He said, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, um, the work culture of Disney in the 80s was, well, kind of like what it is freelance, really, which is just you work all the time. And, uh, and Glenn, you know, and he said, you've got that choice. Either, you're going to, either you go into that culture or you go, I'm not going to do that. And he decided not to, that, that, you know, not to do that all the time, not to, I mean, he worked hard, but, you know, he had a life outside. And, and the artists apparently got really mad about, you know, how is Glenn King getting better than us when we're working all, the, all, all hours and he just swans out at half five and comes back in and draws his stuff. And it's because, partly, the such a lot comes from the real life experience. I could not have made, have done what I did in Boy and Dinosaur. I could not have thought the ideas, could not have visualised stuff if it hadn't been for being around Lottie and being around other children. You draw from completely that experience. I think if you work in children's animation, you should be around children. You know, it, it, it all, I mean, Davey Moore, our lead writer, like, everything comes from his head. And that's the way he works. But, you know, I'd work from, from that life experience. So, you know, she goes back to the sketchbooks and the life around you. So, yeah. Uh, and so that's, that's one, research. And then, and this is the starting to craft away at this stone um, to make a thing. The floor plans, blocking and cinematography. My PC just broke because it had a look at some the new sets we put into and had a heart attack. Didn't want to switch on again. So I'm sorry I can't show you what I, I was going to show you some floor plans from Chillington because I've never worked on a show that has been so complicated in terms of the 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 blocking of where these trains go because you know unlike you know unlike Sean the Sheep, you don't have a field and you can't nip across the gate and you go, this is like, they go on tracks, there are so many tracks, and you literally, you know, you can box yourself into holes. On a script, it's like, oh yeah, this happens, that happens, it's all great. You know, it comes to me to actually work out that how that happens on this predefined set. And I have a 3D visualization of this set that I can swing around, and the first thing I do is to get an aerial shot down do a frame grab of that and plan out with arrows and just things. What if they come here or what if they come there? And it's trial and error. Oh no, it can't work like that because I, uh, uh, uh. And so floor plans are really, really important. If you're doing it, anything, even for two people like uh, around a table, it'd be really, really helpful. And they're blocking in cinematography. So, this, all right, is a piece from a Sean the Sheep script. How do you script something without any dialogue? That's how. All of these are beats. Low evening sun, bits are in the farm, the herd the flock into the barn, bits are closes the farm door. Beat one. You know, job done, bits are ticks off the herd the flock into the barn icon. It is for board. It's the last item in a long list, all now ticked, bits are not satisfied. You know, there's a lot of different ways to stage that. This is a theory. They, um, in stop motion, the setup takes a long time. The more shots you have, the more expensive it is. Also, the genre is silent comedy. And that means placing the camera on a tripod, you know, framing it wide, and letting the actors let the performance come out of the characters. It's very theatrical. 
and you know you, you, the animators are the stars. Um, and uh, so it's about low shot count. So if I have about 80 to 90 shots in an episode, in a seven minute episode, 80 is the is the producer's wish. If you do 80, then you and the producer likes you very much. It's very hard to stick to it. So these scripts come in, and they tend to have about 70 to 80 beats on them. And the theory is that every one of these is a shot. But it doesn't really work that way. But, you know, but this is when we start to do, and this is a blocking in, not the acting pass, not going wild going through this script, starting at the beginning, going to the end, filling all the acting in as you go along, but just starting with the cinematography. Just starting with one drawing that sums up that is, you know, placing the camera, and I'm going, the action is going to happen here, character starts here, goes there. Rob Richards did that all the time, and he was the most efficient, the fastest story artist at Arden. Because I, I find that really hard, because I think acting, I think performance, and I, I, and he was going, hey man, it was like, you know, do yourself a favour, block. And I tried really hard, and there was the learning that was the best thing. Um, and what we did is, you know, for stop motion, because the shots are already built, we literally nipped down at lunch times when the animators stopped working and photographed. And this was an app. It was great. Just, it was amazing. You could just literally take a photo on my phone of the sets from the basic angles that we knew we wanted. And then I'd use that, lit and we'd literally draw over them. And, and they encouraged us to do that so that we were sure that the performance that we were doing on here would work in there. Because it's fine going, oh, I've got this great idea for a shot. But if it can't be staged, then, it's gone, then what's the point, right? It's all going to be reworked out, and it's really inefficient. So they encouraged us to go down with the camera and to shoot that. And, uh, so if you're doing stop motion, that's a really good idea. What I'm doing on Chuggington, it's much the same, although the set is in the computer this time. And I'm much, uh, but the difference is that I'm doing a lot of camera moves. It is, it's an action adventure show, I need to think about that. And uh, we have this program called Redboard, which um, allows us to have this sort of proxy model of the set and we, you move, it's like having the biggest train set in the world, right? And, uh, and the train, and, and, and I'm, I'm there and I'm gonna be like, much more like a live action cameraman and go, what if I pose it from over here or what if I look over there and I get to fly around and, and I love doing that. So my entry in Chuggington is to think of a script, make notes, think about what is the story point of this, and then to get sucked into the set and to see what are the staging possibilities really quickly. And, um, and um, because, and, and, and then again, we do one block out, and that goes to an editor, and they put that in, and that is really important in this software, because we draw over the top of the frames, and if we say, and if the director was to say to us, you know what, just make that on a long shot instead, or do a close-up instead, have to draw everything again, or scale everything down manually to real pain. So getting that shot right is really important. Um, and then when you've done that, then it's the acting pass, you know? It's like, and it's just following like a director, like going back to that rehearsal room, right? It's like, you know, the first thing you do in theatre is to get that script, and the director's going, okay, you've got to be placed here, and let's move there, and then you come over here, such and such happens, and then you go out. You're not talking about the acting then, you're talking about the mechanics of the staging. And you've got a camera to worry about, as well as the actors, so there's a lot to think about. So then we've done that, we're happy with that, and then it's like, well, let's try the performance. And, and that's a bit I love, you know, and then that's really getting in, doing all these really quick drawings. Everybody at Ardman, say, draws totally differently. There's some TV shows where you have to draw on model and everything looks exactly the same. The uh, great thing about Ardman is just not like that. Everybody has a different style. As long as it's recognised, you know, I got told off about the you've got to keep you've got to keep the poses into something. The only time I was told off was if I drew something that couldn't be done by the puppet, like if I went into my Ren and Stimpy style 
draw it, and then, you know, like it's not very helpful to the animators, but apart from that, you know, everything is just, uh, everything is just drawn totally differently, and it's a, it's a story point. And these are drawn and redrawn and drawn again. I do about 80 sketches a day on average, um, sometimes more, and uh, so it's just about, you know, and well, you know, about 1,500 maybe drawing. I think we had about eight, and my board's average 700, which is quite a lot. Seven minutes, that's over a, that's over a board a second. Um, and uh, then, when it comes through edit, then you do the redraws, which take a lot of your time. And if you get time, and if it's important, the polish. When you're just selling a, trying to sell a mood. Um, I'll show you a little bit of an episode, that, which, which I probably shouldn't show you because it's going to be broadcast very soon, but it's not been yet. So this is just between me and you, but uh, <coughs> don't tell anybody, will you? Um, so, uh, but this is our bit when we go into the bar. Oh, and it's it's just got a this is a halfway pass. It's not the final animation. <coughs> it's got a few spot effects in. And so it goes on. And the whole episode, I loved the script because it was just all about something really simple. Why did you get that picture straight? The whole thing is built on that. You know, uh, mainly one set, two characters, let the sparks fly. This, when you wait for it, is called um, Picture Perfect. And it's famous. They, they, they have their biggest fallout ever in the history of Sean the Sheep. The biggest fallout happens in this episode, so but you'll have to wait until it's broadcast. But uh, that's a little, that's a little taste. So you see that the drawing is really quick, really rough for the most part. Um, and uh, let me show you in contrast to Chuggington, uh, which is done the same. I mean, in many ways, it's the same. It's still in the edit, still in the edit, it's still working with an editor, but the script is, is dialogue based, the script really doesn't change. In Shaw Machine, the script can change. That was one of them that it totally changed. Totally. Uh, this, you know, it, it's just about how you stage it, and that's all we're talking about. Um, uh, but you've got the safety of the dialogue, so it's a lot easier to script that way, so you know it's going to work. Um, but uh, so what I'm thinking about here is that uh, how to shoot it and the 
employ a very different genre, action adventure. So, um, but it starts with still one shot, but it's, it's a moving camera. It's a <coughs> They, they're, they're, li they're limited, really, expression-wise. They do a lot of jumping up and down, and, uh, and you're constantly searching for ways to tell a story through through camera. I'll show you one more clip. Okay, fine. Don't only do colour sketches, but um, if you do, it's always for story. What are we going to cover? We'd better go find something. Yes, and two ready to sketch. Sweep around, it's just it's just cut. Was uh, was one genre, 
which I really love. I really love silent cinema. And Golly, who created that show, loved silent cinema. And it came, that's the other thing. I mean, it's like, you know, it came from his love of that. All these good shows come from someone's real experience, a real love, unique thing they can offer. And showing it just a totally different style of film. And I, you know, I really like that flexibility. It keeps you really young. It keeps you really, that's for everything. You don't do university and be a student and then get a job and stop being a student. The best studios, the best experience, it is like a college environment. Arden's like a college. Um, everybody's learning all the time and, uh, and doing crazy stuff. And, you know, going to the cinema and, and getting people in, and having talks and carrying on learning. So I, that's what I love about it. You know, it's not, it can be scary. You know, it's like it's feast and famine. You know, I, I've been, I had a great year last year, built up successively. About, you know, seven years, grew, 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 grew. Last year was really tough. They got, I got Chuggington, it was supposed to be an eight month, I got, came off Shilton Sheep, straight on to Chuggington, supposed to be an eight month contract. I thought, what an eight month contract? That's like, that's like a lifetime in animation, right? That's a long contract. You know, and uh, and I was like, great, and then and then you know a couple of episodes, no, an episode in, and I was just starting to about you know about to finish. I was about when, when's the next episode coming? You know, just trying to plan ahead, and um, and, uh, and then everyone's like, oh, some bad news. They haven't been selling as many toys over the Christmas period, and literally the financiers pulled the plugs, and we're not doing as many episodes. Oh, we're doing them over a longer period of time. This is a really popular show. It's like you'd think, you know, that's a pretty sound bet, Series 5 of Annie nominated on the most popular show. But that's what happens. That's why, so it's suddenly I'm like, oh, great, how am I going to fill three months or whatever? Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, and, and, how, and, and it's hard to work out your mortgages on that, isn't it? You know, but, but you, but, um, so you've got there's a financial aspect and the aspect of the business side of it. If you're freelancing, the, the, that is that is part of doing that. And I have to keep and you always keep a certain amount of projects on the you know always have a few boiling along. Some of them will come and some of them won't. And some of them that don't come along will come around and surprise you a lot later. So it's always about keeping a few plates spinning. Freelancing, and and then I learned having the faith that it will come in because something always comes in, you know. And and so, uh, but yeah, I like the flexibility. But the truth is that it's not a choice really. Most people are freelancers in animation because that's the way the industry is. There's, there's not a lot of full-time animation jobs going. I don't know really, apart from in games. In fact, I don't think that in games anymore. Um, yeah, I was got off in the job. I was point three. Yeah. Do you have any how many jobs would you have going on at the time? Do you put two on at the moment? Uh, it depends. It depends. Um, I mean, right now I'm storyboarding on Chuckington. I'm developing Boy and the Dinosaur. I'm. Um, I've got a project of my own that I'm trying to get off the ground. Um, I. Uh, uh, teaching one day a week. I really like teaching on as well. It keeps me young and it keeps me fresh. And uh, so, and then I and then I know that when I stop getting really busy and I have time, I need to start emailing out again. It's the best time to get a job is when you're already in one. Hey, I'm storyboarding on this right now. Um, anybody else? Yeah. How do you get a job? Yeah, do email people. Like, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm really bad at it. That's what I should do. I'm looking at it. I mean, literally, people do call me, email me. My web, having a website presence is really good. I feel like so vital now. I've heard a lot of people, a lot of people get back in touch with me through my website. Um, um, and, and, and it's a small industry. People, once you work for a few people, they know who you are. And it, the hardest thing is 
and they're really bad. The hardest thing is getting on the ladder in the first place. Um, and that's the, that's the thing, isn't it? Because you know, they, they want experience, and how do you get experience? If, you know, the, so I think, you know, CISO's internship, I mean, I, I, I was lucky. I went in when it was, you walk, it was an internship program. It was a trainee, traineeship. Went in as a as a junior. I I I started in between and stopped went in between a, and you went from an in between to a junior animator to an animator. Now that that's gone, <coughs> and you need to know more than you ever have done. Um, uh, and I think you just got to do it. That's the most important thing. You got to keep on at it. You got to keep on renewing your showreel portfolio. You know, you can get out of the university. It's keeping it fresh, keeping those reels going, keeping the portfolios going. Um, the people who are really having it from the university were people who started sending their reels out, showing people what they were doing while they were at university. Didn't wait, you know, didn't wait to the end. I'm going to make this great film, and then I'm going to show it. And then uh, it was like they made the contacts when they were there. Like Duncan Kamar, who's now a producer at Framestore, he was working the contacts. Then and he was asking for advice. Look at my storyboards. I look at my reels. Occasionally, I get a student, should say, getting a, you know, having a look, have a look at my storyboards. And if I'm free, sometimes I'll, you know, I, I'll, I'll give notes for what it's worth. Sometimes they come back, and sometimes they don't, <gasps> because all some people are looking for is just affirmation that what they've done is good. Um, it doesn't really work that way, no. Uh, I can't take Christy though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anybody else? Oh, thank you very much. Well, thank you. 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 Thank you.